last couple of years have been busy ones for you, haven't they? They've been okay. They've been okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is what we're seeing now in the equity market, or at least since November, uh, enough of a drawdown, a sharp enough drawdown for the universal strategy to be making money for your clients? I, I mean, as always, I just can't talk about that. Um, uh, well, I don't expect you to talk about percentages, but what I'm talking about is the degree of the drawdown, and more importantly, the and here, what we're seeing here, of course, are the drawdowns that we've had since the great financial crisis of 2008, and there have been a few. This is a log chart, helps to perhaps illustrate it sure. a bit better for people. Um, and of course, the pandemic meltdown of 2020 was a huge moneymaker for your clients. Mm -hmm. As I say, what I'm getting at is, is there enough of a drawdown, is there enough volatility for the strategies that you employ to be working in your client's favor right now? Well, I mean, I'll just say, if you look at that chart, you know, this, it's hard to find last month on there. So the mar <laughs> markets move a lot more than, than last month. Uh, you know, the, 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 the types of risks um, from, of, that we saw last month, those types of moves, those aren't the kind of things that are really important. Those aren't the things that are consequential um, mm. to one's rate of compounding over time. Well, what I mean, what levels then do you uh, kick in? I mean, if I buy flood insurance, I know that if my house is destroyed by a flood, that's when it kicks in, right? Where is your flood level? I mean, it's never that simplistic. So, I, you know, it, this isn't a structured product or something like that. It has to do with uh, pricing in the market, different ways that we position things. So it's never that straightforward. Now, there are people out there, Mark, who want to do what you do. Um, they think they can do it on their own, right? They um, mess around in the options market. And Nassim Taleb said in the forward to your book, and, and we can show people a cover of Mark's book, Safe Haven, that your edge comes from being a former pit trader with an intuitive understanding of mathematics. How do you decide uh, when we are in the middle of a volatility spike, when to sell or exercise the option? the options that, that you buy and sell to, to, to crystallize gains on behalf of your clients. How do you know? So this is something that we've just highly systematized over the years. And, and really, that's a great question because it's the primary reason why people should not try to do this themselves. I think I make that point very strongly in my book. That the, don't, someone do should, at, don't try this at someone home. Someone should never try, try this at home because you could even get the trade right and it'll slip through your fingers. So that's, uh, that, that's a good point. But it's something, you know, this is really where the exp a lot of the expertise comes in. And, well, and you have mainly experts um, investing with you, right? This is not something that a retail investor um, can get involved with. They typically go for a 60-40 portfolio. That's been the traditional way to kind of guard yourself um, from market drops. How do you feel about that strategy? Because many people don't have the choice to get into optionality in order to protect themselves. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so it's true. Ours is an institutional, largely institutional product. Um, and, and when people, it's obvious that when people try this, you know, it's, it's really hard to get this right the type of explosive payoffs, explosive protection that we do. So yeah, and so people are forced to look at, as you say, 60-40 or diversifying, diversifying type strategies, the risk parities of the world. Diversifying. Do, well, like that's because that. that's what they are. That, um, this is sort of what modern finance teaches us is that we should lower the volatility in our portfolio. And, we, and, and the hope is we raise our risk-adjusted returns. But in so doing, um, we're actually making ourselves poor. Um, we sort of, so risk mitigation is, has sort of turned into this thing that has a, a cost to it. It doesn't have to be there that way. It shouldn't be. What the goal of risk mitigation, like the goal of investing, should be to raise our rate of compounding and thus raise our wealth. Or else, it should, begs the question: Why do we do it? Fair point, uh, Mark. Jeremy Grantham, the famous value investor who specializes in calling market bubbles, told me last month. He often does. He <laughs> that, that U.S. equities are in a super bubble, only the fourth in history, and that the bubble is already bursting and that it's going to end in a 1920 line like crash. Do you agree? Um, I generally do agree. We are clearly in a, debt, a super debt cycle. There's no doubt about that. I don't Be agree. Careful, you might start sounding like Ray Dalio. I don't. I don't agree that there's that we can tactically trade this, that we can time this in any way. I don't agree with that. I mean, I have a, all kinds of respect um, um, for Grant, for Grantham, but at the same time, I think Cassandra's not him, but Cassandra's generally make very poor investors. Um, we end up. It ends up risk mitigation in that sense ends up being the cure that's worse than the disease. You can get your risk mitigation right, and it ends up being uh, this pyrrhic victory in that um, the cost, the, the, the toll that it had in your portfolio was greater than um, uh, that, that cost that that, that that risk would have, would have, would have had. So you 
don't agree with the idea that you can time it, but if you were to look at the market the way that Grantham is looking at it, or perhaps your own way, you see enormous embedded risks. Well, it's 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 enormous, and it's it's. I think that people who, for instance, today when people think that the the Fed is on this great uh, hawkish tightening cycle, I think there's a profound lack of appreciation um, for how dangerous the market is and how embedded all of this liquidity is in the financial system. I mean, we have 30 trillion dollars of, 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 of federal debt right now. I think that needs to be under, well understood. So institutional investors come to you for catastrophe protection. Uh, how much? Should they pay for that? And at what point, you know, when we get a long stretch between catastrophes, is that too much? Um, so the bleed, that's called, right? Yeah. So again, this this is sort of a reductionist way to think about it. One needs to look at their portfolio. This is a major point in my book: is you need to look at your portfolio holistically. And when you do that, um, what ends up happening is um, uh, uh, you can see that certain risk mitigation strategies, like ours, for instance, they allow you to actually take more on more exposure. So it's what looks like perhaps a cost. I mean, I said I, perhaps when I was on with you last, or certainly t over two years ago, I was saying that I really hope there's never a crash again, and that there's never a crash again. If universe's history um, is any guide, we will remain sort of the optimal risk mitigation strategy. We don't need a crash for it to be that way. That raises a question for me, which is this. If you look at universe's performance, and you've demonstrated this mathematically since 2008, having this portfolio insurance, if you will, I shouldn't call it portfolio insurance because that was in vogue back in the 1980s, but having this insurance policy has worked, right? Demonstrably worked. But we've been in what I might describe as a market that was sort of ever rising with sharp drawdowns and then rising to new peaks. What if we go back with this generational shift in monetary policy to a market that looked more like the late 1970s, right? Stocks grinding horizontally. Yeah. Does the universal strategy work then? Yeah, so I mean, you're describing sort of almost a best case scenario in many ways uh, in terms of risks for equity investors. This is something that, we, that people are praying for, is that we can have these quality of overvalued markets and therefore they're gonna just die and grind up. Um, but we we have to remember again what you're, the scenario you're describing. It's, it would be noise for my risk mitigation strategy in a portfolio. And what you're describing again is 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 is, is, is a is a risk that just doesn't have any consequence. It, it's inconsequential to a portfolio. What matters is other risks, the big risks, those are the ones that have the impact on one's rate of compounding. And this is, so this is not some macro view that I have, some macro statement that I have. This is simply a mathematical fact of compounding, is these risks, whether it's a slow drip down or a slow move up, it, won't, it doesn't really, when all is said and done, if you look at your terminal wealth, it won't have any impact. What has the impact are the, the big losses. Eric's interview with Jeremy Grantham raised a lot of eyebrows, but he wasn't calling for the kind of crash that I think a lot of of um, students of the Austrian school may be prepared for, may have been prepared for after the Fed boosted its balance sheet to $4 trillion. Now we're up at $8 trillion and change. I mean, if we keep boosting fiscal spending and monetary policy, you know, you know, pushes us along, more, more and more hair of the dog, eventually the hangover will be too difficult to deal with. Is there a point when even your fund can't help? I mean, is there a point when no one gets paid? So you're talking about counterparty risk. I mean, that's always there, but that's now you're talking about a, you know, a, 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 term, a terminal type of event. Um, but yeah, I agree. Um, End of the world as we know it. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we have to, we think about it, and we certainly do are very conscious of of of, of counterparty risks and by spreading it out and things like that. Um, this is but, something. That's but this reckoning is something that we were warned about often after the great financial crisis. And yet we continue along the same path, right? So well, when is it coming? Well, there's no and there's no way to turn around. I mean, we're too far down the rabbit hole. You know, if you, if you suppress enough wildfires at some point, you can't allow to let, have any fires burn because they'll completely wipe out the entire ecosystem. And that's where we are today, of course. So again, I think it's an I think it's a profound lack of appreciation by people who think that we're going to go into this this great tightening cycle. Massive, profound appreciation for um, for where we are today, how far we've come.